now discussing uh, the emerging risks of AI, AI for the for the UAE's economy, I would like to introduce His Excellency Omar Al Ulama, Minister of State of Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy and Remote Working Applications, and Mohammed Al Belushi, FinTech and Innovation Sector Head. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I, uh, I'd like to, it gives me a great pleasure to actually introduce our speaker today, uh, His Excellency Omar al ulama His Excellency who was appointed the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence in October 2017 by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Prime Minister of UAE and the ruler of Dubai. Uh, along with artificial intelligence, His Excellency also looks after uh, digital economy and remote work applications as of July 2020. His Excellency's main mandate is to position UAE as a global hub for artificial intelligence. Your Excellency, thank you for uh, coming today. My first question to you would be, it's been five years since we have this mandate. What have been some of the key technologies in AI that, that you've seen or that you've experienced uh, over the five, past five years? Thank you very much and um, it's an absolute pleasure being with all of you here today. I must say, Dubai keeps surprising even the locals. Um, I did not know that this place exists, but now if I, um, if I had a chance to relocate my office, I'd definitely come here. So congratulations on choosing this location. L let, me, um, let me start by quoting Winston Churchill. I don't know the exact quote, so bear with me here. But his quote goes along the lines of, the further back you go, the more you read about history, the further forward you can see. And I really believe this, not just because people say that history repeats itself, but you're able to see the track record of a country, of a city, of a community, based on where these you know, people came from and what they've been doing. So let me start by taking you back 4,000 years. 4,000 years ago, and I'm sure that many people know this, the UAE was a connecting point between um, the Egyptian civilization at the time, the pharaohs, and the Indian civilization. And that is actually prevalent today. We can see it through the artifacts that were found on Saruq al-Hadid. So at that point of time, the UAE specifically, and the Saruq al-Hadid monument was found, not monument, sorry, artifacts were found in Al-Marmoum in Dubai was a melting pot of different civilizations, it was a trading hub, and it was not predominantly focused on a specific breed of people or a specific type of people. It was people from around the world working together in this location 4,000 years ago. Let's fast forward 200 years ago or 150 years ago. The UAE and Dubai specifically was known as a merchant capital for the whole region around us, for India, for the GCC and for Africa as well. And this is true today. That proves that our strength as a country and our momentum as well, it's always going to be based on that principle, the principle of openness, the principle of working with people from around the world, the principle of creating and co-creating with everyone rather than thinking that we can do it on our own. So on the point that you mentioned that we want to be leaders in artificial intelligence by the year 2031, we, inshallah, will achieve that, but we won't achieve that as only Emiratis. We will not achieve that as only the people in this area. Everyone is going to go create with us, and that is the principle that we're focusing on. So let's talk about AI for a second. Um, when looking at artificial intelligence, I know that many of you guys are thinking about infusing AI in your companies, because no company is going to be a relevant company in the next five years if they do not deploy AI. AI is based on data. This is you know, the ABCs of uh, looking at artificial intelligence. And if we think about data, we need to think about what is relevant here when you talk about a global company that has global products and goods and services. And the answer, simply put, is you need to have a good volume of data. You need to have a good variety of data, so you know, not having inherent biases within your data sets. And you need to have a, a good velocity of data. So how fast can you access the data and com continuously improve your company? And in these three Vs, I would argue that the UAE today is the best place on earth. Um, I know it's a big statement, but think about it. You have 200 nationalities in this country, next to you, in one place, with a great 
dissection of the demography. So you have a good representation of Asians, a good representation of Western people, a good Western uh, representation of Africans, of Arabs, etc. And they're all in the same place. So your system developed today from Dubai and from the UAE is going to be globally relevant by tomorrow. You don't have to go and retrain it in Spain. You don't need to retrain it in the US. You don't need to re retrain it in China. The other thing is, because of the continuous investment in the infrastructure, the continuous investment in connectivity, for example, 5G today, many of the locations across Dubai and the UAE are 5G enabled, you're able to have incredible velocity of data. You're able to access your data quite quickly. You're able to also, and we're working on that, open up certain data sets that are you know, government data sets that are created by the sensors that are infused on the roads, in the buildings, across the city, that they will give us more insights on what we need to do. And then finally, you're able to attract talent from around the world. Think about it. If you want to get the best Chinese talent, you can get them here. If you want to get the best Indian talent, you can get them here. If you want to get the best American talent, you can get them here. There's no politics, there's no sensitivities, and everyone can come and thrive together. They can live on their own terms, with their own culture in a place that is you know, quite open. On what excites me on AI, I um, tend to try to you know, not be blinded by the glitz and glamour of it. I think we need to be very practical. What does AI actually do? AI is a technology today that should increase quality of life and improve efficiency. These are the two things, the fundamental reasons why we deploy AI. If you think about using, for example, Amazon, why would you order a product from Amazon? It improves your quality of life. You get it to your doorstep without you having to drive in your car, waste you know, uh, your money on, on oil and, or, or on petrol, sorry, uh, going to the, to the store and buying the products that you want. You can do it from your living room. You can get it within an hour. It's a quality of life play. If you think about AI, for example, in improving services or, or products, it's only going to be an efficiency play. So I really believe that as we go along, we're going to see AI be embedded in everything. But it's not going to be prevalent. We're not going to see it. And it's going to improve our quality of life drastically. That doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. There are a lot of challenges. And we need to, as a government, and as well as responsible individuals, work on overcoming these challenges. But the fact of the matter is, if we put that in mind, if we think about looking at AI for quality of life improvement and looking at AI for efficiency improvement and using the acronym that we came up with for our UAE AI strategy, which is BRAIN. We want to build a responsible artificial intelligence nation. And responsible means responsible development, responsible de deployment, and the responsible use of AI. If we all operate with that mindset, the future is going to be better. Great. Thank you, Your Excellency. And I think you, you slightly touched upon my next question, which is around challenges. Uh, it's a very funny story. We, we actually have the first autonomous uh, taxi showcased here at the DIC Gate Avenue, and our marketing team was, were quite keen on on picturing me in that car and roaming around the DIFC, but we got to know we can't do it, we need special approvals. So what are the challenges that, that we see in implementing AI? Test, one, two, three, test, test. So. Um who here thinks that AI is one technology? Please raise your hands. AI is one technology. I can say AI and that is a technology. Can someone? No, you, all, you all don't believe that? OK, good. Uh, I'm very happy. I was actually going to be concerned. So AI isn't one technology. It's many technologies that fall under an umbrella. And what that means is the challenges differ on the use case. It differs on where you deploy that AI and how you use it. So a self-driving car has very different challenges to, for example, a decision tree algorithm that today uses AI to improve on decision making, or a chatbot, or, for example, autonomous weapons, right? So the challenges here differ. And what's important is for us to understand that when we talk about the challenges of AI, we talk about the challenges that the deployment is going to create, because the main challenge that everyone talks about today that is getting the most attention is the black box scenario, that these systems are systems that we cannot really understand how these decisions are being made, and maybe the decisions are not the right decisions. That's a big challenge, but if the outcome is something that improves quality of life today, I don't think enough people are going to care about it, and it's going to just you know, go there and, and uh, uh, like 
undiscussed or, or um, uh, in some way, shape or form, really people not paying attention to it. But if the use case is negative, if it harms people, then people are going to have a lot of questions of why are we deploying it this way. However, if we talk about self-driving cars, the potential for negative uh, implications, if it crashes in one person and kills one person, even if it is a lot safer than human, people still think that one human life is very valuable. So uh, I think we need to look at it this way and address it this way. I also need to think that we need to look at a few different uh, vectors when thinking about how to deploy AI. How I see it is, first, what is the potential economic return? Because you know the economy is very important and actually having something that makes financial sense is important. Second is what is the potential job disruption? So how many jobs will be lost? And third is how far in the future is the positive uh, benefit going to be? So for example, if I deploy a system that today is going to have efficiency gains, but is going to lead to civil unrest in five years, it's not worth it. Because yes, I'm going to benefit from it today or tomorrow, but in five years, I'm going to have something that's, you know, that is a Pandora's box that I need to deal with, right? So we need to look at it this way and then define how we want to deploy these systems. Uh, if you look at logistics optimizing algorithms, like the ones that are being used for Amazon or Instacart or Noon, these are actually quite good. And the negatives are very, very minimal. So in these applications, I think we need to move aggressively because quality of life improves quite drastically. But in other applications, we need to look and carefully think about deployment. Of course. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, my next question is a bit uh, probably uh, tied to your recent uh, pro uh, mandate that you look after, which is around hybrid or remote working. The pandemic, of course, has changed the way we look at work. Uh, and, and there's a lot of debate in terms of will people ever come back to work or how the future of work will look like. Uh, some actually say uh, that we might end up having avatars at our workplaces and us be, uh, sitting at home. So what, what is the future of work going to look like from your perspective? I'm going to say something very controversial here. I think it's going to be very similar to work as we know it. And I, I'm not shooting myself in the foot here, just bear with me. Let me tell you what I think. Um, work has changed, but I think humans haven't changed. Um, to us, getting up in the morning, getting dressed, going to work, is more of a life calling than it is just about getting the job done. You need to understand that. Um, if you sit at home and do the work every single day, some people might like it, and for some jobs it actually works. But it isn't for everyone. And I think that people are going to come back to the offices and they're going to spend time in the offices. However, where work has changed, I think we're going to see a lot more flexibility. So in the past, if, for example, your kids have a vacation for two weeks, and you decide that you want to go and work from Paris, for example, you know, go to Euro Disney and spend time with them, but work from there. If you told your boss that I want to do that, your boss would fire you on spot. Today, that is quite possible. You can tell them I'll work remotely for two weeks, your boss should be quite understanding because we proved through the pandemic that we can do it. And you can get more quality of life, you can spend more time with your family and you can actually achieve that. But there has to be metrics to measure output. Because saying you want to work remotely without a good output measurement uh, metric is going to be something that is going to cause challenges because your boss is gonna say, why would I allow you to do that? You know, we have a lot of work, we can do that. The second aspect here is it depends on the job. A factory worker who requires being there, for example, for uh, quality control and uh, inspection. It's very difficult for them to do it remotely, even if you use you know, high-intensity cameras, even if you use avatars or whatever, you still need that person to be on the factory floor because they can see things that others can't see. A author of a book can work from wherever, and they've been working remotely over the last you know, few decades. No one has said anything about that. So it depends on the type of job. Uh, I don't want to say that this is something that is going to be relevant to all jobs. A policeman, for example, would you feel good if your policeman was sitting at home and uh, <laughs> doing his job? I don't think we'll feel safe. Even if we gave them drones or autonomous cars, it's still you know, something that you want to see a human there, feeling safe, feeling that they're around you. So it's going to be a shift towards more flexible work. I think we're going to have high quality of life because that is what we care about at the end of the day. It's not about having remote work for the sake of remote work. 
And at the end of the day, you know, uh, we are going to constantly see an evolution of jobs. And that's where I think a difference is going to be made. Great. Your Excellency, uh, there's been a lot of focus on coding as well. We know there was uh, this initiative by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed around a million Arab coders, uh, but also recently under your uh, uh, leadership, uh, there was a new initiative by the name of Coders at Q. We're actually having a session on Coders at Q this week as well uh, by your office, but we'd love for you to tell our audience today what does the Coders at Q actually mean and how can our startups over here benefit from it? So. The reason why we launched the Coders HQ um, is quite simple. Uh, I started getting many phone calls from technology entrepreneurs and startups saying that we have a hard time hiring people um, in uh, the UAE. And I asked them, why do you have a hard time? And they say, every single job post that we put out there, um, we get someone who knows how to code. So for example, even if they're a logistics company and they're looking for drivers, the CV of the driver says Python, coding proficient. And they say when we actually sit with that person, he has no idea what Python is and what coding is. But it became such a you know, slogan right now that if you have this background, people are going to give you the interview, that people are adding it without actually paying attention to knowing how to code. And that gave me an idea. What if we assessed these coders for you and you had an accredited way to understand if a certain person has a certain level of proficiency? So before seeing the CV, you see that his level as a coder is, and this is done by a credible third party that has no vested interest by um, you know, giving fake rankings, um, for you to come and say, okay, I will only hire coders that are of a specific proficiency, let's say they are uh, expert coders, and they are grade four, and there are levels, right? Uh, we will assess them for you as an incentive for the private sector. And the private sector is going to say, you know, if you want to get the job first, go get assessed and then come back to me with your um, level of uh, accreditation. We then also realize that some companies want something beyond coding. Some companies want logic as well. So they want critical thinking. So we said, let's create a system where we can help see the, the critical thinking ability of these individuals as well as their coding ability. That's number one. Let's also create a place where people can be upskilled. So if we know what is your level, we can help you go up by telling you, take this course at an academy or take this course at you know, uh, Coursera or Udacity or wherever it is, and then come back and get reassessed. We then host seminars. So we hosted um, three seminars so far. The first seminar was given by Steve Wozniak. Uh, the second was given by Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas. The third was given by Gary Vee. So we've seen a lot of interest from technology leaders and people who are really big names in technology come to engage with the community. And the final and most important thing is creating a community. Uh, I say this at times, and people don't understand the importance of it. When Elon Musk wanted to start SpaceX, and you can read this in his biography or you can read that in, in online. Uh, when he wanted to start SpaceX, where did he go? Does anyone know where he went? He went to the Mars Society. He went to a community of space enthusiasts called the Mars Society in California, and he spent time with them just to hear you know, what their thoughts are about colonizing Mars, how to go to space, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And then he started thinking about his company by building on everything he learned from the Mars Society. So the question that we had was, where do people who are the equivalents of Elon Musk encoding from this region where would they go? And there's no place for them. Okay, they might come here to meet you guys, but that's not proven, and it's not guaranteed. You guys might not be here, you might be in meetings, people might be busy, COVID, whatever. So we said, let's create a community where people can come together, they can discuss things, they can talk, and then if they wanted to be upskilled, they can, if they wanted to attend a seminar, they can. And that is the point of the Coders HQ. We've seen a lot of interest, thankfully, so far. And we must say that this, this action initiative is for you guys. So please engage. Let us know how we can make it better. So if you have any thoughts or ideas, if there are any shortcomings from our end, let us know as well. Tell us you're doing this very badly. Please improve it. And you know, I, I take it to, to promise you guys that we will improve because our job is to serve all of you better. Great. Your Excellency, we're short on time. So probably my, my last question is around uh, 
we have about 500 startups in our ecosystem and, and the ecosystem is growing at an unparalleled pace. We added about 250 startups just last year uh, and, and we're very ambitious this year as well. What would be your advice to these up, upcoming startups, uh, the, the startup community? Again, it's in line with the national mandate of making UAE a global hub for startups. What's your personal advice to them? That's a very tough question. Uh, I would flip this around. I would ask you guys for advice. Because if you've already come, and if you've already taken that leap of faith to be here, to invest your time and your effort, because money means nothing. Um, honestly, I think you can invest in 10 startups, nine will fail. The one that will succeed is not because it's the most well-funded. It has the founder that put in the most sweat equity, the founder that put in the most time, the founder that suffered the most. And suffering can change, right? Like suffering can be about um, you know, neglecting your social life to focusing on your business. It can be about you know, mortgaging your house or doing whatever is necessary to really give your company that extra leverage. So if there's anything that I would require, I think you guys need to give us advice because you've seen it, you've been through it, you've suffered through it at times. And I think the more inputs that we get from you, the better we can make the ecosystem. Not everything can be improved, I'll be honest. Some things will be changed, other things will take more time. But if we understand from you what needs to be done, we will prioritize it. And that's what, what really matters. The other thing I want to say as well is you need to understand that the mission of Dubai specifically is to be a pillar for the region. And being a pillar for the region means that every single success that you guys have here does not just ripple out on the vicinity of the city. It's not just Dubai that's going to benefit. It's not just the UAE. It's the Middle East. It's the subcontinent. It's emerging markets. Everyone will see this success as a reason to bet more here and a reason to invest more here and a reason to believe more here. You are going to be the reason for someone to say, you know what, I had this idea for a few years. I think this is the right time for me to start it. And I think that is a very noble cause. That's better than taking any other job. Even if you decide to work in the United Nations and volunteer, for example, in the refugee camps, it's very noble. But the impact that you're going to have is on that, the level of the camp. What you guys are doing has an impact that goes far and wide. We've seen the successes in the US. Just think about it. You've seen the success of PayPal, and you got inspired to start a business in the Middle East, right? Or you've seen the success of Facebook, or Microsoft, or Google. And these guys don't look like you, maybe not necessarily look like you. They don't necessarily speak your language. They don't necessarily come from where you're at. But it was so inspirational that you guys took that decision, and you made that bet. What you guys are doing today is going to create that on many orders of magnitude across a region that needs it more than ever. This is the future of our region. It's you guys. It's more of these stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. We'd like to thank His Excellency. His Excellency is actually very busy these days. We understand, His Excellency, you've got the launch of the future of the museum tomorrow. Your schedule is packed and you gave us time today. We'd really like to thank you and best of luck for tomorrow.